Welcome to the interview with Russell Earl McGowan. This is part three, and you were telling us about uh, going to Idaho. Yes, we arrived at Stravel, Idaho. Stravel was just about 35 feet off of the, new, uh, the Utah border in southern Idaho. And uh, as I say, the station had quarters for single men, but no place for married men. So the chief, he said to me, well, you're married. There's no place here for you. Uh, and I said, well, where can we live? He said, well, there's an old schoolhouse up here on the hill. It's been abandoned. Uh, one of the operators, he was married. He lived up there. You can go up and look at it. So we all walked up through the sagebrush, a lot of sagebrush, on a dirt trail. And, oh, I'd say maybe 100 feet up uh, on a hill there was this old schoolhouse. But the minute I saw it, I knew I wasn't going to live in that because it had boards all over the windows to keep it, and it's cold up there in the winter. Uh, so I said, no, I don't think we'll live there. Where, where else? He said, well, there's a town uh, 23 miles uh, north of here called Malta, and they, they have quarters. They have a tourist court. So I said, well, that's where we're going. So we get back into our 1934 Ford Rooster, which we bought for $100 down in Venice, and we went down to Malta, Idaho. And uh, in Malta, we met Mr. Horn. And Mr. Horn, he was the owner of the trailer court. Well, it wasn't really a trailer court. It was a tourist court, they called it. And they weren't very elaborate in those days. They were kind of flimsy. It had a little place to put your car in underneath, uh, next to it, and then a little go rooms, a couple rooms, and then another place to put a car and a couple more rooms, if you can visualize something like that. But anyway, we rented that from him, and I had to drive now 23 miles back and forth to go to work at the station. Well, gasoline in Idaho at that time was 35 cents a gallon, and when we left Venice, it was 12 cents a gallon. And my salary, believe it or not, was 1200 a year, which uh, in that area there, people thought was pretty high pay, uh, as no one around there made that kind of money. But uh, it was $100 a, a month, and uh, it didn't go too far when I had to spend so much money for the gas, uh, and uh, we didn't have much money left over. And they would have movies in a... Uh, the store had a room in the back and they'd get a movie and they'd show it in there. People would come with their dogs and, 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 and everything and sit around and we'd watch a movie once a week, I think it was. And then they had a Grange Hall there. Actually, there were only about 100 people in the whole town. But in the Grange Hall, they used to have a dance now and then and, or a, a get-together, which was kind of nice. The people more, were mostly all Mormon people, Mormons. And uh, there was a school there, and the school had swings. And uh, Lorraine and I used to go over after the, school, the children left, and we'd swing on the swings. And uh, we'd take the 34 Ford, and we'd go up uh, on a warm day in the hills and on roads, and I'd shoot rabbits and uh, jackrabbits. There were thousands of jackrabbits and uh, rattlesnakes in the summer. They'd be crawling out on the road. I'd shoot them and bring them all back down to town and give them to the man that had the store because he had a quite a few mink in the back in cages. He raised them for fur and uh, they needed the meat so I, he'd grind them up and put, and put them in there for the mink and they'd eat them. I don't know what they did with the fur. I guess they spit it out. <laughs> but anyway, fur and all in. And uh, that uh, went on and uh, then uh, I got transferred finally from uh, Stravel, the reason I was at Stravel, I didn't mention, was because I was a radio operator and could send and receive Morse code. And the station at Stravel, Idaho had no power at all other than huge motor generators, two big motor generators and big steel towers painted red and white for the radio antennas and uh, no telephone. And all the overflights, when I did contact a plane, uh, by uh, radio, which we did. It was usually uh, Western Airlines going to Le Lethbridge, Canada. They had flights to Lethbridge, and we'd contact that and, and other planes, private planes, 
and uh, then we would took weather observations and all that information was sent to Burley, Idaho, which is about 35 miles farther north, another airways traffic station, and uh, they had telephone and teletype and they put the information we transmitted to them by radio on their teletype so then it would be on for everyone to see. So uh, anyway, eventually uh, they transferred me to Burley, Idaho, and uh, this was a much busier station. I stood at eight hour watch alone, and I had many, many flights over because the war had just started. And oh, we had bombers and many, many planes over. And very, very busy. So I rarely got to eat any lunch at all. And they had teletype circuits. And you had to be cognizant of everything within 300 miles of that station. If a plane left, an army plane left Davis Monthan Field in Tucson, Arizona, you had to, had to get that off the teletype because this flight plan would be on there when he departed. And you'd have to estimate his speed and what time he'd be over your station to lay it down in front of you. And when he did finally come over, you had to, he'd contact you. He'd say, Burley, Idaho, this Army 708 over Burley at so many thousand feet. Then in turn, you would give him the information that you had, for instance, on Davis Moth and Field. And uh, also, you maybe he was en route to uh, 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 Mountain Home, Idaho and uh, the southeast runway was uh, closed due to construction and you'd copy that off the teletype where you'd have that in front of you and you'd give him that information. What I'm trying to do is uh, make you aware what type of work we did and how important it was to the overflights to have that information. And also the weather. We had to take weather observations. We, we studied weather and uh, we took a weather observation every hour, and there was one teletype machine that had sequenced weather. In other words, the Salt Lake weather beyond, Ogden weather, Sorrel weather, Burley weather, Mountain Ho weather. Then he'd go in sequence order, and then if a, play, a pilot was flying, why well, he could look and see what the weather was ahead of him. That was the purpose of it. It was very, very important that they got these weather observations. So uh, we all never missed one of those, ever. And uh, uh, that was one of the things you had to do in between answering calls to aircraft over. And sometimes you'd have to run out of the station while you were out there. You'd hear calls coming in on the speakers in the station. You'd have to race back in. It was uh, very quite hectic uh, at the beginning of the war, naturally. And uh, experienced operators were very scarce, so they started trading ladies. Uh, and but they didn't know Morse code, so they couldn't be at isolated stations. And uh, I was a burly. Uh, got uh, I finally. Uh, this, oh, and while I was a burly uh, station, why Sharon was born. She was born on February the 22nd, as I remember, and uh, she was born in uh, Burley, and uh, Burley, Idaho. And uh, but her birth certificate was in. Uh, the capital of uh, Idaho, uh, Boise, in Boise. That's where she gets her birth certificate. Anyway, to make a uh, long story shorter, I got transferred from there. No, I didn't get transferred. I resigned because Sir, uh, Lorraine had gotten money from my mother, unbeknownst to me, and went back down to visit her mother. And I was alone up there, so I thought, well, I'd better get back down there because she didn't like Idaho very well anyway. So I resigned and I went back down to uh, California.